Hello, my name is Lowell Vanderpool and this channel is dedicated to IT students, IT professionals, and anyone who enjoys learning technical subjects. All right, we're in day three and I want to start off with keeping a good attitude in the workplace. You know, users can really try your patience. It is one of the most difficult things for IT pros to keep a good attitude with users, especially if you work in a corporate environment where you see the same people all the time. It's worse if you're answering phones from all over the globe or from your external customers. That can be just as challenging because users are quickly stumped with some of the simplest problems. You have have to help them with a good attitude. Now, honestly, I've met people that love people and their attitude in life in general is such that they just love to work with people. That's great. I'm happy for them, but I'm not that kind of person. I have to constantly check my attitude, especially when I walk in the door and I've got 6,000 emails from all of these problems and I see the same names and I can look at the email and know it's a simple problem or I'm looking at a help desk tool and I see the same thing. It can really get to you after a while. It is really important that you check your attitude every day at the door and make sure you realize the only reason that I'm in this company is because those users can't solve their problems. So I need to enjoy them, solve their problems, and that's why they cut me a check every two weeks. Now Process Explorer and Process Hacker both have a right mouse context drop down menu that's so powerful and it brings to mind some of the new features and concepts that we want to explore in processes. First one is window bring to front. So if you've got a user, you log on to the work or you come up to a user's workstation and they've got 4,000 windows up and you're trying to troubleshoot Excel, you can take your process explorer and just say, bring it to the front because it's hidden behind so many windows on the screen. Who knows how they work effectively every day, but it'll just simply bring that window up to the front. Affinity is another right mouse click option on your process and it allows you to assign the process and the threads in it to all the CPUs that you have on that hardware or only a few. This is a powerful feature. So right now I have running CPU Z, which is a well-respected program that analyzes your CPU, your cache, your motherboard, memory, etc. It's written by a Japanese developer and it's, it's a great program. What it does have is a benchmark program, which is going to demand a lot lot of CPU time on this virtual machine. So I'm going to go ahead and say, yep, and uh, run this benchmarking program on this virtual machine, which is going to kill the performance of this virtual machine. So let's go ahead and stress the CPU. And if you slide down here, you'll notice that I am using an enormous amount of CPU time from this application. Let's say this was a server application that you just had an update and now it's doing this to your server. Well, if you had multiple applications on that server, everybody is screaming and, and kicking a fuss because they can't do anything. This one application is just taking over the entire server. I can right mouse click this application and come up to affinity. And here I can say right now, this application is using all of the processors that are available to this virtual machine. And I'm just going to uncheck them all except one. So it will still run, but it only has access to one CPU. Notice I went from 96% utilization to 16% utilization. That is why I love affinity. Now, once you reboot, you're back to a problem child. But on a server, this can get you through until you can get an update or a fix from the software developer. Now, another option with Process Explorer and Hacker, Process Hacker, is it allows you to change priority. Now, that doesn't impact a lot. Not as much as you saw with changing the affinity. But you can go in here and tweak a little bit an application and give it more priority. Generally, I found that that doesn't do much. Notice in this diagram, if we look at the threads that are brought to 
to the scheduler for execution of the CPU, it looks for the priority of that thread. So notice I have a thread 1 that has a high priority, thread K with a high priority. When the scheduler looks at those threads, all the ones that are coming up for execution, it's going to choose the ones with a higher priority. Now another right mouse click feature in Process Explorer and Process Hacker is the ability to suspend a process. Now you use suspend processes all the time. You have an Android phone, you pull up an app, and then you pull up another app. Well the other app you didn't close, it's suspended. So your Android phone suspends apps all the time. You don't do it, it's just done for you. So that app is still being active, but it's not being executed. So it doesn't demand any hardware resources from your phone. Now you can do that also in Windows. You can suspend a process and it just it's takes it out of the CPU execution cycle. But remember, when you do suspend a process, it turns a dark gray color, and that allows you to know that you can also resume it. You can right mouse click and say resume, and it goes back in to where it's active, and it can be executed. The threads inside the process can be executed. So that's important. You do it every day on your phone, but in Windows, it's not as common. Now, uh, UWP apps, Universal Windows Platform apps, all take advantage of this feature. This is why Microsoft is moving us to UWP apps and away from desktop apps, the type we used to install all the time. You can also right mouse click on any process and restart. Now remember this terminates the highlighted process and starts the same process again with the same command line arguments. Just keep in mind that the behavior of that process does not mean that it will always behave properly or the way it did before. There could be a different logon context. There could be other things involved that impact that application. By and large, just restarting a process just starts it all over again, kind of like starting an applicant, closing out an application and starting again. But that is not true of every process. Just keep that in mind. A couple more features. We have properties where you can actually pull up the property of every process. We'll go into that in depth. And then you can search online. You can take the file that launches the process, go to Google and search for information about that file. So for example, if you've got a process and you're suspicious about it, you're wondering if this is malware and it's launched by windows.exe. Well, it allows you to go to Google and say, hey, is anyone out there know anything about windows.exe? Because it's running on my desktop. Just be aware there have been exploits very carefully crafted exploits that know that this can happen. Techs will understand how to use Process Explorer. They understand how to use and, and examine their operating system. And they actually develop websites with malicious information about that file. So when you go to their website and it shows up in the Google search results and you click on it, it's going to give you false information rather than correct information. So let's say I'm suspicious about a process process running on my PC and it's called msedge.exe. I'm going to go search online. So as I look at my search results, I'm going to be very careful as to who I'm trusting. For example, www.filenet. I'm not even going to pay any attention to it. They do not have the kind of information that I, I'm looking for companies primarily that are going to be Bitdefender, Kaspersky, Semantic, Antivirus, companies that are reliable, well-known, well-established. I'm going to look very carefully at URL. I'm looking for companies that can identify this file name that could indicate that this could contain malicious code. I am going to trust only reliable companies, not just anything that comes up on the search result. Be very careful with search results. Be a very vigilant and alert person using the internet. Don't just click and go. Process Explorer, Process Hacker, and many other system internal tools were designed by Mark Rosinovich especially for removing of malware and identifying malware. That's not the subject of today's lecture, but I promise you it's coming and we will spend a great deal of time showing you how to use these tools powerfully to identify malware and remove it. Now another feature in the right mouse click on processes is creating dump files. You can create a mini dump, which is a smaller subset of information that is dumped and put into a DMP file. It's okay, and there's a lot of times you can analyze a problem in a process using debug, and the mini dump will show you what's wrong. But many times you need a full dump 
So you notice you have the other option, which is a full dump. It does not terminate the process when you create dump files. And when you do, a DMP file is created. Let's, let's take a look. So I'm going to take OneDrive. Let's say OneDrive is an in-house application and it's having problems and you would like to communicate as much good information to your developers as you possibly can. So the best thing to do is create a dump file and let them take a look at it. So I'm going to right mouse click and I'm going to create a full dump. And it's just, where do you want to put the file? And I'm going to go ahead and put it OneDrive full dump and notice the extension. DMP. That's going to allow a debug program to open that file and analyze it. So I'm going to save. Now I'm not going to go into debug right now. I just finished a series of videos on advanced troubleshooting for frozen lockup computer servers and applications where I really go into more advanced. How do I deal with more complicated problems that are locking up my computer or the application is freezing? And here we get into debug. And so I have video one. I also have video two. So between the two, I give you lots of additional tools and ideas, procedures and technique strategies to deal with these more complex problems. If you're a brand new student, just stay on the day one, day two, day three track. Don't worry about these yet. If you're at help desk or you're a level one technician, you want to definitely jump in and start learning some of this. Now I didn't ignore Process Hacker because it doesn't have great features. It does. If you look at the right mouse click on Process, it has a lot of the same things that Process Explorer has. Now one of the biggest problems with Process Hacker is that it doesn't have documentation or the documentation is very limited. I did put a lot of documentation that I learned in the video notes. Now Process Hacker has some features that Process Explorer does not. It has an unload module where a programmer could remove a DLL from a process. It has WS Watch which puts a limit on the page file on paging from RAM to the page file. It has an ejected DLL where a programmer could put in a DLL file into a process. Now that's all programmer and developer features. Those are not things that the IT Pro needs as much as maybe the developer does. All right, we're ready to jump into a concept called process states. Processes go through a series of states. You create a process. We see in Process Explorer and Process Hacker, it turns green. Then it goes into main memory. It is now considered the wait state where it is waiting. If you'll look at the graphic over here where the threads are waiting by the OS scheduler to be put into the CPU to be executed. That's exactly where this process is in the waiting state. When you move from waiting to running, this is known as context switch. Look over here to the other graphic. When the thread is move from the waiting state to the execution state. This is known as context switch. So anytime a thread is executed, that's a context switch. We're going to see Process Explorer and Processor Hacker will show us that very important metric. Now, once it's been executed, it goes into what's known as a block state. Maybe it's waiting for something to be done, maybe a keyboard input, maybe another thread to do something, but it is in a blocked state. Once it gets unblocked, it moves back into waiting. So it's run again. And so we just cycle from waiting to running, block, waiting to running, block. Now the memory manager can step in and say, oh, the application that's been blocked or the application that's been waiting, kind of like your Android phone, you move that application out and you've launched another application in front. The application that you move to the background is now suspended. And so the memory manager manager can say, uh, let's just take it and move it to page file. Let's move it to the page file on the hard drive and we'll just put it in there. It doesn't need to be even runny. It doesn't even need to be in memory. So it'll move it to the page file. And you can see we can swap out block code into the page file and we can swap out waiting code into the page file. And this is how we efficiently manage RAM. So if you've got a process with threads, and that process is not being used or more memory needs to be freed up, those processes will be moved to the page file. So this is a very important concept. Now, eventually you're going to terminate that process. And you can see over here, 
the whole process. So created programs on the disk, it gets double clicked and launched. It's put into memory. So we move from created down into main memory. It's going to be waiting to be executed. Every time it goes from waiting to running, it's a context switch. And then it may go into the block state where it's waiting for an input or a thread activity or whatever. And then eventually it's moved into the waiting, it's executed, and we just go back and back and forth. It could be that if you've left something in RAM for a period of time, or you launched a really memory intensive application, all of a sudden the memory manager says, wait, we got to get a lot of these applications that are in RAM to the page file. Now, Process Explorer and Processor Process Hacker allow you to see that context switch. I'm going to come up here and slide Process Explorer over a little bit so we can see more columns. I'm going to get rid of sessions. So you can see I can put things in my display or take them out based on what I want. And what I am going to add under Process Performance is I'm going to add the context switch. I want to see how many times, and I'm going to slide this over, grab that column header and slide it over. I'm going to come up here and sort all the processes on this Windows 11 box. And I can see what process has been executed by my processor the most. I can see my hardware interrupts have been executed the most, and that doesn't surprise me. That's a normal function of your PC. I can see that the kernel is the third most executed code on my system. Makes perfect sense. Then as I go beyond my system, I'm looking for any third-party application that is in the top 10 of most executed code. And then I'm going to ask the question, does that make sense? Does that third-party application need to be executed fourth largest in my list or my fifth largest in my list? And when I look at that application, it hardly does anything important those are questions that give you an insight to, is this third-party application well-designed? Is it poorly designed? Is it an awful application? You need to get it off your computer. So let me show you what you have already learned, and this is just day three. Let's say you were brought in as a small IT team assessing the impact of a client-server application your company's thinking about buying. They've given you some demo software so you can test it on a couple workstations, and you're asked to do the installation, see what kind of problems you have. Does it have a problem with the rest of your corporation applications? And when you're installing and running it and testing it, you're looking at the things I have already taught you. You're looking at working set. How much RAM is this new application demanding all day? What is the context switch at the end of the day? How many times has this new software been demanding and being executed? Does that make any sense based on what you know of the application? I'm going to also show you how to look at network traffic. Is it too chatty? Where it's talking to the network and adding a lot of network traffic that's going to impact your switches, your network, everything. So these are simple things, simple concepts that can allow you to have an intelligent conversation or put in a report back to your supervisors. It doesn't make you a software analyst, not in day three. With a humble attitude and a little bit of knowledge, you can talk intelligently, giving really good metric information back to your supervisors. Let them make the decision. Don't, don't send them an email saying this is a cruddy piece of software and you've only done day three. Not a good start. Thank you.